also have we have uh, Lynette Thompson with me, and then Ann Thurine and Lana Doolin. So we want to welcome you all to our presentation this morning. And we're excited to talk about treats. And um, Lynette and I was just, we're just talking this morning. This is my home office, and this is where I work now, eight hours a day. And I have a beautiful view of our maple tree in front. And um, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have that view of a tree. <laughs> so it helps me get through my, my long days of, of working at home. So welcome, everyone. Um, this presentation will be available on the Nativity Lutheran Church website. We'll also have um, all of the links that are at the the end of the presentation will be in a PDF that will also be posted on the Nativity Lutheran Church website. So don't feel like you have to try to copy down URLs. That's painful. Don't do that. Just come to the Nativity website and find that presentation. All right. So I think without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to mute everyone and um, locate the chat at the bottom of your screen and ask your questions there and um, or comments and we'll have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers and discussion. So welcome everyone and thank you. Okay, Donna, are you going to um, so I guess I'll get us started. This is our agenda for today. We're going to help trees. Okay. She... I, yeah, I think uh, Lana's audio is not working real well. So um, can you hear me now? Let me... Oh, yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I, I'll run us through the agenda. So real quick, we're going to cover three topics today, how trees provide habitat, how they help the environment, and how they improve our well-being. And do you want to go on to the next slide? So I'll spend 10 minutes talking about um, some of the benefits trees provide to wildlife and to soil. They provide food and shelter for birds, animals, and insects. They provide shade and create an environment beneficial to plants, bacteria, and fungi, and they provide nutrients that create healthy soils. Next slide, please. And Anne, can you hear me okay? I'll assume so. Um, so here's a few pictures of some common animals that rely on trees for food. You'll see that all parts of a tree are grazed on by different animals. Flowers provide pollen and nectar to bees, butterflies, and other insects. Berries are a source of food for birds, bears, and forest mammals. Some of our common berry-eating birds are the cardinal, robin, chickadee, cedar waxwing, and orioles. Acorns feed over 100 species of animals. Pine cones feed squirrels, chipmunks, and woodpeckers. Leaves feed large herbivores and small caterpillars. Twigs and bark are a critical source of food in the winter time and chipmunks and 35 species of birds. It contains potassium, calcium, and magnesium. All three are essential for bone health. Next slide, please. A tree's canopy shelters many types of wildlife and microorganisms. Birds, bats, insects, small mammals, bacteria, and fungi can all be found sheltering in trees. Over time, bacteria and fungi will cause decay, which makes it easier for nesting birds and other animals. Next slide, please.
Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide and just a list of top 10 trees that are known to support an abundance of wildlife. I've included five trees from that list that are native to Minnesota. The red cedar is host to 30 different native moths and butterflies, and the cones provide food for birds. Oak trees host more caterpillars than any other tree. There are 532 native insect species that thrive on oaks. Acorns feed over 100 species of animals. They're considered the cheeseburger of the forest because they're eating among the first trees to flower in the spring and provide critical nectar to early merging bees. Their twigs are also a critical source of food for moose in the winter. Native cherry and plum tree leaves provide food for caterpillars. Their spring blossoms provide nectar to bees and their fruits feed songbirds, game birds, small mammals and black bears. Cottonwoods are used for raptor nests and beaver lodges. Their shoots and stems are eaten by small and large mammals. Over 40 species of animals are known to nest in hollowed cavities in the cottonwoods. There are many more uh, native trees that are also critical to Minnesota wildlife. If you're thinking of planting a tree in your yard and you want to support wildlife, it's important that you plant a native tree. Our native trees, insects, and birds have all evolved to get impact on the wild at the University of Newark, Delaware. Native and non-native plant species determine the diversity of the animal communities. He has a video called Living Land Species and the Specific Insects They Attract and the Specific Birds Those Insects Attract. He also talks about non-native trees such as ginkgo tree. It's a nice looking tree and it has wonderful leaf shape. But here in Minnesota, it provides no nutrition. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna leave the tree canopy and move down below to talk talk about some of the benefits trees have on the soil. Trees shelter in abundance of life on the forest floor. That gives you perspective on the multi-tile. There are all kinds of critters that take part in creating a healthy and dynamic forest ecosystem. I recently heard a discussion on NPR with Susan Samard a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia. She talks about the interrelationship of trees and the chemical and biological exchanges that take place within the soil. Her latest book is called Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. One in Action she highlights is birch and fir tree to be a mother tree because of the diversity of life it's least. Trees also help to stabilize soil and improve soil structure and fertility through nutrient cycling. Leaf litter accumulates nutrient rich moisture, which soaks into the soil. Decomposing leaves provide nutrients and organic matter in the soil. Fungi and bacteria translocate nutrients within the soil litter system, which increases soil fertility and improves soil structure. This nutrient cycle intensifies in decaying trees. The nitrogen fixing bacteria increase the nitrogen level in decaying wood. Nitrogen, calcium, and magnesium all accumulate in decaying wood, and animals that live for water to carry out the nutrients. And I'm going to turn to pollinators and talk about some of our native trees that pollinators rely on for pollen and nectar. Heather Holm is a local author and expert in native plants and bees. She recently published a list of trees and shrubs for pollinators, the different types of pollinators they support. Happy from her website. Heather talk at the Best Practices for Pollinator Summit in March, pollinated trees. When you consider the size of trees, their total bloom area 
and produce the equivalent of a massive garden. For example, a 70 by 50 foot black cherry tree can produce the equivalent amount of pollen and nectar as a 3,500 square foot garden without the need to weed. Of course, not every yard is big enough to hold a black cherry tree, but the idea is that the different native trees have a bloom span from March to September and they create their own aerial garden. Next slide, please. If you're considering planting a tree in your yard, take a look around your neighborhood, identify the different types of trees that are already available and consider planting a tree with a bloom time that complements the trees around you. Heather recently published a book that identifies different native trees and their benefits to native bees. In her, in her book, she organizes them by tree size. Here's Heather's recommended list of large native trees. You'll notice it doesn't include all trees known to bloom. She's focusing on the species with the ideal bloom time to support a wider array of native pollinators. For example, in the maple family, box alder and silver maple bloom too early before native bees begin emerging. The maple tree she highlights in her book is the red maple because it has a later bloom time and the UV markings are attractive to bees. Um, next slide, please. These are a few of the small trees and large shrubs on Heather's list. The pussy willow is an early bloomer and prefers wetter soil. It's a larval host plant for moths and butterflies. The wild plum is extremely fragrant and it attracts a large diversity of insects. And pagoda dogwood is one of my favorite shrubs. It has a beautiful horizontal form and it doesn't sucker like other dogwood species. Uh, next slide, please. I I'm not gonna talk about any more shrubs, but this is just an example of the small shrubs she, she highlighted. Um, she highlighted these in particular because they serve as larval host plants and they, they attract a large number of pollinator species. And that's it for my part of the presentation. All right, thanks Lana. We had a little trouble hearing you at times and I'm afraid I, we were floating around on some of the slides, but I hopefully we got the message across. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the environmental benefits or ecosystem services that trees help us get in our daily lives. Um, trees improve our water quality, our reduce heating and cooling costs, increase property values, not only for our homes, but for our businesses and so much more. So simply stated, we really need trees. So let me talk about some of these services here. First one is the cooling power of trees. I know today we can all identify with how much cooler it is to sit under a tree on a hot day. Um, lot, there are lots of ways that trees help reduce temperature. I mean, you can feel it when you just stand in the shade of a tree, but trees also release water into the air, which lowers the temperature. Uh, think of uh, sitting in a mister somewhere and knowing how much cooler it feels with that that moisture going into the air. This is called evap evapotranspiration, and the transpiration from the trees then evaporates into the air and cools. So we know that shade can lower the temperature in the area from anywhere from 20 to 45 degrees. And I, I must admit, I experienced this yesterday walking across the street to my neighbors and in the, oak, the shade of a big oak tree, it just felt so much cooler. I just felt the whole temperature drop as we walked under the tree. So it's important to carefully position trees to help reduce that sun in the summer. Um, and in fact, you can reduce your energy consumption for heating and cooling by up to 25%. And the, in fact, the US Department of Energy says even placing only three trees in the right position can help save an average of $100 to $250 in yearly energy costs. You may have also heard the term heat island, which is where the city has a higher temperature because of all the concrete and hard surfaces that hold the heat. Trees can reduce that overall heat island by 10 degrees. So trees are really cool. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that pun. Okay. So how do they help us improve and protect our water quality? 
They do that by reducing runoff and pollution from reaching our water, whether that's our streams, our rivers, our lakes, even our aquifers and watersheds. So trees help with runoff in a couple of ways. First, trees slow down and temporarily store runoff, which then promotes infiltration of that water into the ground. Then their tree roots help to stabilize the soil and prevent erosion. And those tree roots and leaf litter create soil conditions that promote that infiltration of water into the soil. So Lana talked about all the benefits of that leaf litter and those microorganisms, but it also helps get, keep the rainwater in our soil. And the presence of that leaf litter not only promotes infiltration, but it de decreases the risk of flooding or erosion even downstream. In another way, sorry, okay, another way, trees and forests reduce the amount of storm runoff by capturing and storing rainfall in the canopy and then releasing that water into the atmosphere. We talked about that earlier with the evapotranspiration. Another thing trees do is help with pollutants. Trees and our forests can reduce pollutants by taking up the pollutants from the soil and the water through their roots and then transforming them into less harmful substances. And finally, trees improve the water quality by slowing and filtering pollutants from rainwater, protecting our aquifers and watersheds. All right. So next we're gonna talk about oxygen production and what trees do there. So we often think about plants producing oxygen, but we don't always think about trees as really big plants. So one tree can produce enough oxygen for four people each day. Wow. Another way to think about that is that trees produce nearly 260 pounds of oxygen each year. Now, not all trees produce the same amount of oxygen. It's not just the size, but the type of tree that makes a difference. For instance, pines are at the bottom of the list in terms of the amount of oxygen they release. And it's because they have what's called a low leaf area index. Now that's not just a simple view of how big that leaf is, because you think of pine needles as not being very big, but it's the leaf area and, and also how dense they are and how much area of the ground it covers in terms of shade so it's a little more complicated than that, but you can look up and see which which trees produce the most oxygen. So oaks and aspen, for instance, are kind of in the intermediate area. And then trees like Douglas fir, spruce, beech, and maple are at the very top of the list for oxygen release. So I talked about leaves removing water pollution, but they also remove air pollution. Um, I couldn't find any data for Minneapolis, but um, the U.S. Forest Service does this um, view, and they say in Chicago, the trees remove more than 18,000 tons of air pollution each year. And in Kansas City, it's about 26,000 tons of air pollution. So I'm assuming Kansas City has a bigger tree canopy, but I know the Twin Cities has a great tree canopy, so I'm certain it's producing a lot of our air pollution. So not, trees not only help with the overall air pollution, but they can also block pollution from coming into your homes. Um, when they measure air pollution in terms of particulate matter coming off of roads as, as cars and trucks and things pass by, trees that are between roads and your house can reduce that particulate matter anywhere from measured from one to 60%. So that's pretty significant. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about trees and their ability to capture carbon or carbon sequestration. Um, the definition of carbon sequestration is here. Basically it's capturing and storing carbon dioxide, which is a way to reduce climate change. Trees and forests sequester carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. The woodlands in Minnesota, on an average, store 75 tons of carbon per acre. 
and about half of a tree's total weight is carbon. So they're an amazingly efficient sequestration. The, again, the amount of carbon that's stored in a tree depends on its size, age, and species. Um, so it's typically measured in pounds or kilograms, but a single tree can sequester as many as 10 pounds of carbon each year. And you could see by the chart that different trees uh, sequester different amounts. So the ones at the top, the maples, the oaks, the hickories at the beach are the best, and the cedars and the larch at the bottom. So I was thinking about this, right? I mean, we just talked about trees can produce 600 pounds of oxygen and sequester 10 pounds of carbon dioxide in a year. I think that's a pretty impressive superpower. All right, so what's the value of your tree? You know, when you think about all of these things, I, we found this great website that'll let you calculate um, the ecosystem benefits of your tree. Um, I actually did this for a tree from out in front of Nativity. We have these beautiful snow crab apples, you may have noticed. And so I measured the diameter, looked at the condition, looked at how close it was to the building and put that data in. And you can see this calculated that we get a benefit of about $40 a year from different aspects, carbon sequestration, stream runoff protection, energy savings, and emissions avoided, all the things we talk about. But when you think about purchasing a tree, and I know they're not cheap, but look what it saves in a year, besides all the other benefits that Don, Lana talked about and Lynette will talk about. In addition, we all know that trees add value to your property. Um, in fact, I found some statistics that this said, if you have trees planted in front of your house, those trees will add the value, the same value as if you added 129 square feet of finished space to your home. So they have a lot of value in both ecosystem and monetary means. So if I haven't convinced you about the importance of trees to you personally, I wanna leave you with a bigger picture. Minnesota is made up of various ecological areas. They call these binomes. And you can see by the legend there that yellow is, is the prairie, the dark lower green is tall grass and aspen, the bright green at the upper left is our broadleaf forest, and then the blue, thankfully, is a large mixed forest area. But a key component of climate change is the increased amount of carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere and the way they are heating up the Earth's surface. And unfortunately, trees are very sensitive to the change in the average temperature and also the effect on rainfall. So as climate changes in Minnesota, the Minnesota biomes will change. And tree species are especially susceptible to this change. So there's a risk and a prediction based on data that says in 50 years, the state basically could be all yellow, could be all prairie with a very small little bit of broadleaf forest in the tip of the arrowhead. Unfortunately, I didn't have a picture of that, but I think you could envision what it would be like if our wonderful forested state ends up being mostly prairie and no trees. So what can we do to help decrease that impact? And, you know, not think about in 50 years, not having any trees here in Minnesota. Number one is to plant trees. And Lana talked about some resources and we have those attached at the end here. So you can use that not only to pick out a tree, but how to plant a tree. Also, we remind you that it's good to plant a diverse set of trees. Uh, we all can remember the Dutch elm disease wiping out so many trees in our area. And of course, emerald ash borer is still a risk. And so if you have a diverse set of trees, it, it helps to prevent um, if a disease comes through wiping out our entire canopy. Also plant a tree that fits into your local environment. Um, one that makes the water needs, maybe your animal needs, the pollute, but the pollinator needs you're looking for. So think about that when you pick out a tree. And then when we talked about the cooling and heating, you wanna plant a tree where it'll most help your ecosystem. So 
you know, planting on the east and west side to block out the summer heat. Um, plant on the north and west side trees that will block the winds in the winter. And also plant on the boulevards to keep the over not only the overall heat island reduced, but also to block pollution from reaching your home. And finally, we talked about those wonderful vertical layers of trees and shrubs, you know, help planting those will help to clean the water and reduce runoff and erosion. So now let's finish with a deep breath and think about all that wonderful oxygen that those trees created while I turn this over <laughs> to Lynette. Okay, Lynette, take it away. Thank you, Anne. This is Lynette. My topic is the healing power of trees. I'm going to take you on a really quick history lesson um, and come back to our present day with my slides. Um, I'm also using some a visual aid of puzzle pieces as, as we move through these slides. So first slide in. Puzzle piece number one is titled Botanical Medicine. Our ancestors in the United States, as well as across the world, for thousands of years used tree parts and plant parts for treating human illnesses and disease. I myself personally, I'm probably more familiar with plants. Um, I've certainly heard folks talk about using echinacea, St. John's wort, uh, lavender, and mints in, in, uh, in helping their illnesses. But tree parts are just as important. The bark, sap, nuts, and flowers can be processed and turned into teas, salves. Um, perhaps in the past, you've heard of something called a poultice, which is similar to a paste, and oils. Over a period of time, and probably with some trial and error, the tree species were matched to particular effects on the human body. And I've given you just three quick examples. There are many more. Cinchona trees are native to South America. Their bark contains quinine and quinine was found to be useful in treating malaria. Willow tree bark has an ingredient uh, called salicin. When humans ingest salicin, they turn it into salicylic acid. And this is a precursor to our everyday common aspirin. Witch hazel, uh, witch hazel bark, twigs, and leaves can be processed into a liquid. This liquid has been found to be antiseptic and is, has been used for treating um, skin inflammations and irritations. Uh, perhaps you've used it for bug bites in your past. Next slide. So puzzle piece number two, we're gonna jump ahead into the decade of the 80s. Robert Ulrich is a professor of architecture. And for nine years, he looked at some patients in a suburban Philadelphia hospital that were recovering from gallbladder surgery. All of the patients were in similar rooms with the exception of the window view. Some patients had window views of brick walls and some had window views of a stand of trees. Um, now you might think this gallbladder surgery um, certainly wasn't involved, um, but it, back in the 80s, gallbladder surgery required a long recovery. Often people were uh, inpatients for about a week and it was a, a relatively painful surgery with the incision right below the rib cage. Anyway, after this nine years of study, uh, Robert found that patients who viewed the stand of trees had quicker recoveries and were discharged sooner and used less pain medication. 
at the time of the study, I'm guessing there weren't that many medical folks who uh, read this information and probably those who did both in the architecture uh, field and medical field probably said, well, that's nice to know, but there really isn't any practical application. That was going to change in the, in the coming years. Next slide. Puzzle piece number three, we're over in Japan and the Japanese Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries came up with an activity called Shinrin Yoku. There was a lot of concern about um, workers putting in long hours in stressful environments and needing some relief and comfort measures. So Shinrin Yoku translates to forest bathing in English. Um, the Japanese certainly have a, a heads up on this activity and have done much more research um, than we are um, in the United States, but we're rapidly trying to catch up. Forest bathing is something you may have heard of. Uh, the Arboretum has, our Minnesota Arboretum has been involved with forest bathing and some of the community um, education programs are now talking about offering forest bathing uh, visits and guides into our local parks. In fact, Anne was, uh, took advantage of a visit uh, with forest bathing, I think a few months ago. Next slide. We're still in the 1980s and Harvard professor Edward Wilson published a book titled Biophilia. The definition of biophilia is in humans have an instinctual bond to nature. We are just naturally drawn to living organisms, uh, living things, uh, our outside environment. I know that I love smelling lilacs right now. The crab apple blossoms were spectacular this spring. I love the smell of freshly mown grass. And I would love to walk barefoot um, in that carpeted, freshly mowed grass. I'm guessing most of you have had similar experiences. And this just seems like, well, of, of course, this is, this is how our world um, uh, goes on and how we appreciate nature. But it was really the first time biophilia and the um, there, there, there was, it was put into words. So we had something to talk about um, with this term. Next slide. Puzzle piece number five. Richard Louv, a journalist, published a book titled Last Child in the Woods. He came up with this term of nature deficit disorder. He was talking about nature deficit disorder primarily being in children and he gave uh, examples, he gives examples through the book of um, how children now have a minimal time outdoors, um, do not know what to do with unstructured playtime outdoors. They're, they're more used to um, uh, scheduled team sports whether it's soccer, baseball, but if they're sent outside and told just to go play, it, it became very difficult for a child to know what, what did that mean? What should I do? Um, there are lots of reasons for nature deficit disorder happening. I'm sure you can come up with a few more reasons too. One of the biggest is our technology craze and our need to have our cell phones um, by us 24 seven. And I, you know, I looked at this book um, and, and felt like it should have a big red warning sign on it. I, I think it was, it, it was one of the last pieces to help us wake up as to what was happening with our children. So next slide. So wake up. Um, did start some early studies 
began to try and tie together nature and human um, human body systems and what benefits are really derived from this exposure to nature. Can they be measured? Can we really prove that there's something beneficial going on here? So early studies were done kind of a pre and post nature experienced exposure. Uh, measurements that could be easily done like heart rate, blood pressure, and saliva were, were taken before and after um, various nature walks. And what happened? My goodness, after, after a lovely two hour or so nature walk, um, it was found that people's heart rates diminished, their blood pressure diminished, and their cortisol levels, uh, a stress hormone indication, also lessened. In addition, sub subjective improvements were also noted. People reported that they slept better, they were able to return to their work environment and attend to the tasks better. And there were, there were numerous other um, um, comments that were made with, with this nature experience. So next slide. So here's, here's a little tidbit that I think is really exciting. Uh, trees produce something called phytoncides. Uh, it is an organic chemical that is released by the trees. The trees do this to support um, their own defense system, but this chemical is released into the surrounding air. And lo and behold, it's been discovered that these phytoncides, um, which can be inhaled by humans, also help us. It's been beneficial uh, in terms of helping us increase our what's called natural killer cells or our white blood cells. Next slide. So I only gave you five puzzle pieces. I'm thinking we have at least a 100 piece puzzle and maybe a 500 or a thousand piece puzzle. These early studies um, are just taking us in a direction where we have more and more questions. Um, I've just listed, well, there are five. Looks like they're all number one <laughs> in this slide. Um, the, at the top, is there a minimal time in nature needed to reach health benefits? Currently, I've been reading about 120 minutes being the magic time for health benefits, that 120 minutes a week. And it doesn't need to be done all in one big lump. Um, it could be something like a 20 minute walk, six days a week. Um, that time may or may not change as we, as we learn more in the future. Um, other questions, can a small city park provide the same benefits as a forest? I hope so. Our metro area has lovely parks and, and I'm hoping that we can, um, we can take in the same benefits um, and not have to drive two hours north just to walk in a forest. Does the time in nature need to be active versus a passive experience? Well, certainly not taking your cell phone on your nature walk. Will, will increase your benefits. Does the nature spot need to be safe? And if so, what characteristics does that include? I think that's been a big factor with our children and feeling um, that we can send them outside without adult supervision and, and be safe in um, taking these nature <clears throat> benefits. And then can fake nature provide the same benefits for people unable to be outdoors. Well, you probably may have some of your own opinions about that. Um, anyway, this is just a sampling of, of questions and um, I'd love to hear I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I believe that's the end of my time. All right. Well, 
Um, I think we're missing our final slide, but we'll oh. we'll fake it here. <laughs> All right, everybody. So we have some recommendations. And what are things that you can do? What are like the top five things that you can do? Um, you can, number one, go ahead and um, plant a tree. So find a tree and make sure it's the right tree for the right area. Um, number two, go and appreciate a tree. So go and look at a tree, observe the leaves and the bark, look at the roots and understand how deep and how wide the roots might be for that tree. And look at who might be using that tree. Are there insects and caterpillars and um, birds and bugs and, and critters, squirrels that might be using that tree? Um, advocate for trees. So work with your local municipality, your city, your county, your state, even national organizations and advocate on behalf of trees. So make sure that your city understands the importance of trees. And when they're doing some tree replacements as they might do with um, emerald ash borer, for example, make sure that you can talk to the um, city forester who's probably a contracted person and express your desire to see native trees planted and not, for example, ginkgo trees or things like that. And look for new and upcoming um, research on trees. We're gonna find out more and more and more about how trees communicate with each other. And I think what trees might be even telling us at times. So watch for research on what, um, what's happening with how we understand trees and their role in the ecosystem and how they communicate together. You know, I think it's interesting, and I, I don't know the reasons why, but has everybody experienced the large number of maple helicopters <laughs> this year? It has been stunning. And um, I know it's our neighbor's tree, but I also know it's trees blocks and maybe even miles away. All the maple trees seem to have gotten together <laughs> and communicated and figured out this is a great time to produce a lot of seeds. Um, and one reason sometimes why um, nature produces a bounty of things is to increase the chances of survival for just a few things. Um, so there are years when there are tons of acorns, that's called a mast year, and it's just an effort to by the abundance of produce to actually ensure that some acorns do survive and, and become trees and then some maple helicopters um, survive and actually become maples as well. So we have a list of, um, of uh, websites and some uh, references that I think that people will will like, it's choosing the right tree and, the sh and shrub. And some of this comes from the DNR as well. There, we can find out about the urban heat island, how to care for newly planted trees. Um, Heather Holmes is a great resource. You can just Google her and find out about it. Um, there are some things that Lana talked about, climate change and forests in Minnesota. And this is a great presentation on climate change. I can't say enough good things about Doug Tallamy. If you have time, go and look on YouTube for Doug Tallamy and you will be transformed. His books and his presentations are um, life-changing in understanding how do we need nature and how do we um, support nature and ecosystems. And then uh, Lana talked about Susan Sinard, Samard. Um, that was just a recent uh, 
a recent webcast with um, NPR. So, and Sharon asks, is there a handout with all these websites? Yes, we will post these live links in a PDF document on the Nativity website. So go ahead and um, check out the Nativity website. Give us a couple of days because I don't think it's there yet. Um, but we will have all of those links available in a PDF for you. So I'm going to unmute everybody here. And um, it's time to ask questions if you have them. Right here. Hi. Hi. Any questions for us? Can you, where are you, dear? I don't know. Right there. Right there. Do we have the camera on? <laughs> I, have, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, we have some of the lousiest clay soil in the world in our yard. It's just terrible. And do you know if there's any uh, source or recommendations for, I mean, we planted a, a, a variegated, uh, it's variegated, but it's a Norway maple. And boy, it took three or four years just for it to, just to get its head together. It was just terrible. Now this year it's finally, you know, it's just really, really hard in this soil. Do you have any resources for that? You know, John, I don't specific. Go ahead. John, I don't specifically have one tree to recommend for soil, but I would be happy to bring you over my um, Heather home book and we can take a look through. She actually lists the types of soils different trees are best in. So um, I'm happy to bring you my book if you want to take a look through it. That would be nice. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, this is Anne. I have another recommendation. If you go to the University of Minnesota Extension website, you can look up something called the 30 tough, the best plants for 30 tough sites, and it's published out there. And they will recommend both shrubs and trees and other plants for, you know, clay soil, steep slopes, those tough places we all struggle with in terms of planting our plants. So, so that's another source that you could look at. Thank you. I, this is Lynette. I lived in New Brighton for 36 years and struggled with clay soil um, on all of my property. And it is really, really difficult. Um, I, about the only uh, additional recommendation I would make is adding some compost um, periodically to, to loosen up your soil. So um, just a comment on what I've observed is our cabin in Aiken County is there's a lot of clay soil in Aiken County. And um, we have a lot of oak. So, um, you know, look maybe for a variety of oak, like a swamp oak, maybe, and, and it doesn't have to be in the swamp. So, um, so anyway, just think about that. Think about an oak tree. And if you're looking for something short, Pagoda Dogwood does really great in our yard too. Yeah, an oak tree, you know, you you have to believe in tomorrow if you're going to plant an oak, <laughs> right? Well, the old line is, if you want to, when's the best time to plant a tree? And that's 30 years ago. Yes, yes, right? yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and enjoy your tree, uh, hopefully this summer. It sounds like it, it might be taking off a bit more than it has. <laughs> hey, 
Hey, I'm sorry for my connection earlier. I turned my video off and I hope it's better. Um, I sent you guys the deck that I use with my notes on, on the notes pages if you want to actually just read through it. Um, Kate, I didn't have your email address though. If you want to post it, I'm happy to send you my deck with notes. And then I'm happy to loan my Heather Home book out. It's a great resource um, if anybody really is looking getting out trees and trying to find a, a good variety. Yeah, Heather Holm is top notch for um, understanding how native plants and um, flowers, plants, shrubs, trees, all of that support ecosystem uh, ecosystems in um, Minnesota. She is fabulous. If you follow her on like Facebook, she has wonderful photographs of bugs mm -hmm. on plants, if that's your thing. It, <laughs> and, and her handouts are wonderful. They're just packed full of information. They're easy to understand. Yeah, and she, she features her photographs on those handouts. Um, they're free. She posts them on her website. Great resources for what plants do I want to include in my native plant garden or um, in, in sun or in shade or in sandy soil or in clay soil? Um, she's very thorough and um, is all, she's all in on native plants. So, and just to reiterate, um, there is a native plant sale happening at uh, Shepherd of the Hills. Yes in uh, Shoreview on North Victoria, right around the uh, 694, I think it's just north of just 694, north of 694 on Victoria in uh, Shoreview this and that's, morning. That's today from nine until one. Yep, and there's a variety of, of vendors who are there. So we just had a plug in our chat room from Patty Kendall, thank you, about Silverwood Park has self-guided forest bathing trail that is a certified forest bathing. And um, as I mentioned, I actually did forest bathing this winter um, and, and it was a wonderful experience. So um, that's thanks for sharing that, Patty. And I did you have a, a two hour experience or was it longer? Do you do you remember? It was longer than two hours. Wow. Yeah. And, and it was it was in the winter and you know we just dressed warmly and it was a wonderful experience right you know, the forest is <laughs> a pretty amazing place, even when there aren't any you know things green. Um, there's a lot to see so. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions anyone. Well, I would say, first of all, thank you all for coming and particularly on a day like today, I hope you all appreciate those trees that you have around you and how much shade and cooling. I mean, with, if we didn't have them, that 98 we're going to get today would probably be 110 or something, right? So, mm -hmm. so thank you, superpower of trees. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. All right. And I hope that this was a, a good experience that, you know, people learned something that they didn't might not have known about trees. So thanks for joining us and do take care. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Hey.